And I asked him, I said, well, why didn't you do that? And he turns around and he looks at me and he goes, because I couldn't find one. And nobody would give me one. Oh my God. That and I'm like, scary. whoa. That's weird. You know, that, that was, that was a nasty wake up call. That one was. Yeah. That must have been paradigm shifting, that alone. That must oh, have been oh, the, oh, the oh, moment. Gosh. That must that have been the moment. That, that, yeah, I, I was stunned for, mm -hmm. it, it was paradigm shifting. It was at that yeah. point, I could no longer deny yeah. this, you know, and that these things were dangerous mm -hmm. uh, and, and that they would get one of these guys to knock me off if they could do it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was paradigm shifting. Well, what I found, you know, in my, in the recent years, last four or five years, um, something shifts you have this paradigm shift i've had several you know going back to when i was schizophrenic then again in my mid to late 30s and then they become more rapid as yes. the years go by they become more frequent because you're less scared of the paradigm shift you understand that if you keep your mind open you know let's let's consider all possibilities let's not close down on anything until we have some kind of evidence or some kind of a capacity to understand with a much big, bigger mind frame you know but i remember maybe four or five years ago going down this rabbit hole i call them rabbit holes i think you know it's probably a well well coined term where suddenly you have to look at the world in a completely different way yes yes you, you completely to, different way completely and, and what's more is not just one thing it kind of the dominant everything, effect, everything. Yep. It everything it, it's, everything. it spreads everywhere government yeah. military you look at the insanity in the world it's all linked to this kind of stuff exactly and and then you start listening to people that you think oh my god i would never have listened to that person 10 years ago i mean he was a fruitcake you know i'm thinking of david ike um and these people that are around and about yes, yes. and you start listening to them with a new ear uh-huh and you think could it and then you think, no, it can't be. And you go into this state of shock for yeah. what for me is like, for me was a period of probably minimum six months, if not longer. And, you know, every time you open another door and you go down another rabbit hole, there's another, there's another avenue into the same yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, you know, the, what you're describing to me at the moment, and I think I've heard you talk about it in other interviews, is this Archon energy, this Jinn yes. energy. Reptilians. Reptilian kind of parasitic Jinn type yes. energy yep. that it feeds off of negative emotion. Negative emotional energy. They can't produce it themselves. So yeah. they're doing to us what we do to cows. You know, you put the cow out to pasture, he eats the grass, he, we eat the food, you bring it back, you isolate it, you milk it, and put it back again. That's exactly what they do to us. We go out, we eat the food, we, we produce the energy, we produce the emotional energy. They have to turn it negative before they can take it, though. Yeah. They can't stand positive energy. Yeah. Which puts, which kind of puts a light on what's actually going on around the world. Why there is so much media propaganda to whip up one side against the other. Trump yes, versus. They, they thrive on the conflict. Yeah, so they love the conflict. They love the the negativity. They love the anger, the hate, the rage. Well, that's food for them. That, it's like a hog's trough. The prison was like that too. You know, it was a very negative environment. No, no good thing would be tolerated in that place. You know, I worked for years to com uh, develop a computer-assisted drug ed education, parenting, uh, uh, alcohol education program where the computer would, they, they would take booklets that were not copyrighted. We, we did we made a, a bunch of them on all these programs. The prisoners would take them back to their cells. They would study them. They'd come back, and my wife is a computer whiz. She created the software that would test them. So it would not only randomly present them a question, it would also mix the answers because they were always cheating on everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They could not cheat this. Mm -hmm. And there, was, there were several levels of encryption there. And... 
hundreds and hundreds of inmates were being educated as to the dangers of drugs, you know, parenting, all, all, all this stuff that they need to know at virtually no cost to the prison. Mm -hmm. We went down to the university, we bought all these used computers and we've programmed them up and, and they cost, they were very inexpensive. The amount of time they spent studying kept them occupied on the prison units for tens of hours a, a, a week. And then they'd come in, the computer would give them the test, it would score it, it would data bank it, and then they would turn in their book and that would be their ticket for the next one. All the staff there had to do was to start the computers and feed the encrypted passwords in there that would start the program. Once that happened, it was automatic from there. You know? mm -hmm. But what they did and this happened in almost all cases, is they would give one of their inmate clerks those encrypted passwords. You know? mm -hmm. And then what would happen is the inmate clerk would start a business out of it. He goes, hey, man, I'll, uh, I'll see you pass test 10 if you uh, see that I get uh, three candy bars from the store this afternoon. You know? and, mm -hmm. and they would be cheating at a massive level. So what was, what was it's like a two-edged sword. You know, on, one edge was was helping them and, and teaching them what they needed to know to cope with their problems. And, and here's these guys come in and the staff are actually giving them the encrypted passwords to these programs to the inmates. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen just here. It happened in Oregon. It happened in Nevada. It happened in Kentucky. I mean, it's like no good thing would be tolerated there. So mm -hmm. when I saw this, I went to the warden a couple of words and I said listen this is what's happening it's got to be stopped your staff are turning have turned over the you know and some of them would turn on me and go well, hey you you know you're causing trouble here just you know because they're getting all these big numbers out of there hey you know 500 inmates went through this program last month that's all they wanted was those numbers whether they went through them validly and actually learned something or not they didn't care mm. you know now there was one guy who did care and and we did we we what we did is anybody caught using any kind of drug was mandated to go through these programs, you know. So it was like front end drug interdiction, and and the warden supported this, but then it it just spread out of control. Where I'm seeing all these prison units throughout the state where we set these up, the same thing was happening. These lazy staff would not even open up the computer and then turn it over to the clerk. It gave them the passwords. So I went to the head of, uh, uh, at the time it was the drug section and uh, the head of the drug education in, in Phoenix, the big cheese. And I, I told her, I said, listen, this is what's happening. You've turned a program that could be of great benefit to these people and it's being turned into the biggest cheating scandal there is and you're reinforcing their criminal behavior with this mm -hmm. and they won't stop and I have no control over it. you need to stop this and she looks at me and she goes you don't tell us what to do we tell you what to do <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I'm, like, I'm laughing what? because it's just so and ludicrous what? here I spent Good years one. developing this thing and That's it amazing. works. We proved it works. It's occupying in hundreds of hours of inmate time where they're staying out of trouble. They're not idle. They're learning something. They're coming out of here better educated than they ever had in their lives. It's costing you virtually nothing. It, it, it takes no staff time. It takes no paper. It takes no resources. You're not paying contractors. It's virtually free. And you're telling me this? I said, no, it doesn't work that way. The software was written by my wife. She mm. owns it. You do not. Mm. You either straighten this out or shut them down. Yeah. You know what they did? What? They shut them down. <gasps> they shut them down, all of them. And then I stopped supporting the rest. That whole system went down, and there was, it was the best program they ever, ever had, the best program they ever will have. It cost n virtually nothing, and it was completely measurable. And, you know, it was like, okay, I give up, you know nothing good and, and and we had a, a thing there there was a, a handful of us that kind of stuck together and it was like nothing good will go unpunished in this place mm, nothing good will go unpunished i like it I but it, i'm it. laughing because it's so do you know what i mean this is just so back to front and upside down it's everything's the wrong way around yes yeah especially yeah. in there so these guys are coming out in much worse shape than they ever went in 
Mm. You know, they, they, there, there, was, there was one time where uh, this one psychotic prisoner I was working with was getting worse and worse. And he kept coming in and he saying, I'm going to, I'm going to kill this guy. I'm going to, there's one guy that he, he, his voices were telling him to kill. And he was out of control and I really couldn't do anything to control him. He was off meds. So I sent him to over to the medical unit and the chief psychologist at that time, he was trying to work his way up the ladder to be a big cheese up at central office. And one of the complaints central office was having was, Hey, we're spending way too much money on any psychotic drugs. So what this guy did, he wanted to look good. He sent one of his stooges, who was also a psychologist, over to the medical unit and charged him with send, changing the diagnosis of these guys that were being sending over there away from psychosis to personality disorder or something where they didn't require medicines and then sending them back. Yeah. So he was saving. Now, <clears throat> he could blame the guy over there. You know, so he was like the Wizard of Oz. He was behind the scenes doing all this stuff. So I, they sent the guy back, and I, I documented in the medical record again, hey, he's saying this. He's threatening to kill this guy. He's off medication. So here's all the psychotic symptoms I'm seeing. You know, and I sent him back again. Mm -hmm. They sent him back again saying, oh, this is a personality disorder. He's not psychotic. Wow. So again. I added all these pages. This is, what it, this is what's happening. This is what he's saying. This is what the guards are saying. This is what the units are saying. This is what his roommate's saying. This guy's psychotic. He's going to hurt somebody if he's not medic medicated. I sent him there again. So here's all this stuff documented. They sent him back again. Oh, he's not psychotic. Mm. A, a week later, he stabbed another inmate 13 times. I was so furious at the chief psychologist. I was afraid that if I went to work, I would kick the crap out of him right there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I stay, I was so angry. I mm -hmm. stayed out of work for like two or three days after that. Mm -hmm. Then when the chief psychologist saw everything that I had documented and this guy still stabbed this other inmate 13 times, he didn't kill him, but he, he turned him into a pin cushion. Mm -hmm. Then he got paranoid and he assigned another psychologist to monitor everything I wrote in the, in the medical record and had to be approved by that psychologist before he, it would go in there. Because once it's in there, they can't take it out. It's against federal law. So he figured, oh, he'd get me to stop me from, from writing these things before it got in there. By then, I was really good at spotting these guys. I mean, I could, I, I could spot them in a hair's breadth. And, you know, you're talking about psychotic prisoners who got sent to prison because they – they really did something bad. You know. But this, this demonstrates that the power that psychiatrists wield over the population, really. I mean, we, we've heard of um, psychiatric mind control. You know, well, it's not just the, the psychiatrists. It's also this guy was a psychologist. And right. he, was, he somehow weaseled his way in over the psychiatrists who were contractors. So he was monitoring them. And the one psychiatrist who was assigned to work in that unit had his own private practice. So basically they had this little secret agreement where the psychologist would monitor all the units and have all these guys ready to be seen when the psychiatrist came in. You know, so he was kind of doing the checking and, and that allowed this guy to run his private business on the outside. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was one psychologist or psychiatrist there who, who refused to buckle under to this bullcrap and and he said i'm going to practice the way i know to practice the way i feel is right and he would give these guys medication if they needed it mm -hmm. they fired him they gave him a really bad rating mm -hmm. said he was using way too many drugs and they fired him which I is a paradox i thought it was, i thought drugs was a psychiatrist you know wet well, dream. It was, but, but this see it is and this, this psychiatrist was doing what he knew best with the drugs. So if he felt a guy needed any psychotic drugs, he'd prescribe it for him. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But what the psychologist was trying to do was to get psychiatrists who were contractors to not prescribe drugs at all if he could get away with it. Mm -hmm. The only time they, he, he wanted them prescribed is when the guy was so far out of control that he was causing management problems on the prison unit. Mm -hmm. then he would okay it. You know, not something like, oh, this guy might stab somebody. Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. 
So, oh boy, you know, I, I was, I was so furious. And then he watched me like a hawk from there, you know, and it was like, I don't know how you survived in that system all those years, Jerry. I mean, there uh, must have been some, you know, tungsten style, you know, grit to your determination to stay there. How did you do it? Well, I, I, I did it as long as I possibly could. But then when they put me under investigation for the, uh, for the guys recovering, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they knew because they had a one MMPI on that one guy I was talking about, which was a set, uh, uh, it was a valid MMPI profile that he took before MMPI, for multi, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which is, that's like the holy grail for psychologists. It's mm -hmm. a, a, it has a, a psycho, psychosis scale and it, it measures all these aspects of personality. It's probably the most researched test that they have. And uh, it showed that this guy who had recovered was actually psychotic when he entered the prison and it was a valid profile. So when, when this guy told the, the psychologist who was investigating me, you know, that, <clears throat> that to eat crap and that I was helping them, the psychologist got ticked off and he goes, well, would you be willing to take another MMPI? And the inmate said, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. So he did take it, and it, it was valid, and it came out that he was not psychotic anymore. His psychotic scale was in the normal range. They looked at that. They had the two profiles, and they go, something is happening here. This guy is experimenting with inmates, and he's found something, and he didn't get our permission to do this. I would have never got it if I asked. <laughs> I would have never got it. Matter of fact, they ordered me to stop doing whatever I was doing, but they didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> they couldn't, they they couldn't never, get you to stop. 